Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kalanji Bankoli. I'm a software engineer from IBM. I've been working with them for the past, I'd say, three and a half years so far. I started out in the cloud computing unit, and I've recently transitioned over to the Watson Artificial Intelligence and the uh, IoT division. Uh, so before I get started, I'd like to ask you in the audience, so how many of you have heard of or used uh, cloud computing? Okay, just a few of you. Okay, so those of you, how many of you have heard of uh, serverless or event-driven architectures? Okay, so just a few. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, get a bit of the background of the audience. Okay, so moving forward, so just a brief overview of what you and the audience will learn today. So I'm gonna start out by just talking a bit about cloud computing and essentially how it's evolved over the past few years to make day-to-day -day developer operations much easier. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about serverless and event-driven architectures. Uh, so I'll explain like the basics of these architectures and explain exactly why there's so much excitement and growth um, of these in, in these architectures over the past few years. Uh, I'll also talk a bit about um, how these architectures can help uh, develop developers create cloud and IoT applications more quickly and efficiently. Uh, finally, I'll finish up by talking a bit about OpenWhisk. So OpenWhisk is essentially a new open source project that we've recently released. Uh, so that's out on GitHub. And essentially what this allows is for uh, users to be able to consume uh, some of these event-driven architectures um, so they can either deploy OpenWhisk locally, so on-prem on their laptop, or they can use our hosted offering at boomix.net. Okay, so moving forward. So first, I'll set the background to explain exactly how these event-driven frameworks can be so beneficial. So if we um, trace back and figure out what the developer's ultimate goal is. So their ultimate goal is essentially to be able to write some code and some business logic and be able to get that deployed to a production environment as quickly as possible. So if we go about a decade ago, then we would see that the developer would have a lot more tasks on the operational side. Uh, to deal with. So, for example, they'd have to um, deal with uh, provisioning and configuring hardware. Uh, they'd have to determine the hardware capacity and availability, and so on. So, to, uh, to uh, address this issue, Amazon essentially came out with their web services. And what, what this would allow um, for our developers was to essentially be able to provision um, virtual machines and block storage on the fly. Uh, well, on demand as an alternative to bare metal machines. Uh, so next after that, then container technology came out um, as a result of Docker being released. So this essentially allowed for developers to be able to package their code as separate microservices, as well as being able to package and distribute their code um, along with the dependencies and image as needed. So this microservices approach essentially allowed for larger apps or larger monolithic applications to be broken down into smaller modules. So since these microservices are independent units, uh, each can be tested, uh, iterated upon, deployed, and even removed without really affecting uh, other units. So it's great for agile development and collaboration. Uh, so this approach has been become very popular in recent years, especially due to the increase in agile development processes. And um, so essentially instead of developers having to all work on a monolithic code base, they can break up the application and just work on each isolated microservice. Um, so microservice don't, microservices don't have to run in a container. Uh, they will work in a VM, but containers are eas easier to isolate and package. So um, essentially the main goal in each of these advances of cloud computing was to, again, decrease the amount of operational tasks required by the developer and allow them to get their code out to production more quickly. So now I'll talk a bit about uh, functions as a service or serverless architecture. Okay, so just to set the stage, so let's say that you're a developer and you come up with the perfect app, app idea, so you come up with the next Uber or Snapchat. So after solidifying the idea, you might spend a lot of time actually writing up the, writing up the app code and uh, getting a prototype running. 
So after you have this prototype, uh, you'll probably have it on a local development machine or your laptop or something like that. So you'll need to then go on and get a server up and running so that you, your application can um, run there. So um, after you've got the server running, uh, so you put the code on the server and you send uh, some friends a link to the beta. So after the first week, uh, probably something's going to go wrong. So maybe your hard drive is going to fall over. Uh, maybe your uh, Linux image is going to have a new security vulnerability. Or uh, there, there's just like so many things that could go wrong. So you, as the developer, are essentially spending all your time uh, firefighting and just dealing with these day-to-day -day operational issues instead of uh, focusing on the actual application code and, and focusing on the uh, user experience. So essentially what this serverless model will allow for a user to do is to not worry about maintaining these day-to-day -day operations. Uh, so they don't have to worry about like hardware crashes, scaling, uh, updates, and patching um, security vulnerabilities and so on. So uh, essentially, again, allows for the developer to cut out all these operational distractions and just focus purely on their code base. So there is a bit of controversy around the term serverless um, because obviously the servers still exist. Uh, but the idea is that the developer just doesn't have to worry about maintaining these servers. So, yeah, so many of my colleagues actually prefer the term function as a service. So the idea is that the developer can write a stateless decoupled independent function and just upload that to a serverless engine. So once this is uploaded, then the function can be manually called through a HTTP request, or it can be triggered off of a change in a service like a database or a message bus. Um, so there are similar offerings that have been out for a few years called a platform as a service. Uh, so some of the more uh, popular platforms of, as a service are Heroku and Cloud Foundry. So these essentially allow for the same thing, to write some application and essentially just send your uh, entire code base off to the service, which will then handle um, dependency, scaling, hosting, and so on. Uh, so the primary difference here is that a platform as a service will deploy the application in such a way that um, it's always idle and waiting for requests. So this, the way the serverless model is different is because it spins up portions of the application code on demand. Um, and essentially, these portions of the code are, um, are executed in temporary containers. Um, and then these temporary containers run the code, uh, send off a response, and then get deleted afterwards. So this serverless model isn't an uh, IBM-specific thing. It's, it's very popular. Um, um, the community, so Amazon, uh, Google, and uh, Microsoft Azure have all um, released their own solutions. So, but the primary difference is that um, our particular solution is the only open source one, and it can actually be uh, ran locally and on-prem. Okay, moving forward. So with the rise of cloud native applications, we've seen many types of workloads emerging that are natural fits for event-driven architecture, <clears throat> especially for those that monitor and react to rapidly changing data sets. So for example, there can be applications that uh, take an action every time a new order gets added to a database. So that would be like a more traditional web app, like a, a web store or something. Um, in an IoT context, uh, an application can also uh, depend on or depend on methods that respond to uh, changes in sensor data. So this can be something like a motion sensor, or um, it can also be like a temperature sensor uh, passing a certain threshold. Um, other applications are also built to analyze trends. So essentially, these can be trends in something like social media, uh, but this, this can also be uh, aggregated um, sensor data as well. So it can run an analytics against this aggregated data and essentially uh, detect anomalies and respond as needed. Um, and finally, one of the more basic use cases is for tasks that only need to run based on some set schedule, such as a cron job. Okay. So as these newer type of workloads are being brought to the cloud, developers will find that there's qu 
quite a large number of challenges when moving their application from a local development machine out to a cloud production environment and essentially like making them uh, fault tolerant and highly scalable and so on. So many readmes and GitHub are developer works articles. They tend to show a user how to get a single monolithic instance of their application up and running. Um, fine, but like when they actually try to push the application into production, they'll, they'll need to start thinking about breaking down their um, application into containers or VMs. Um, they'll also have to start thinking about how to deal with the load balancing, uh, making their services highly available and um, so that they can effectively scale and uh, recover from outages with a minimal downtime. So for example, if like a particular region or a data center goes down, their application should be able to recover from that quickly. Um, so there are products such as uh, Kubernetes and Mesos, and essentially they're supposed to address many of these concerns, but it, there's no size fits all method. It, it really depends on, um, it's a case by case basis, so it really depends on the nature of the application. So some of the more traditional cloud architectures where, um, where things are always on and running aren't really always the right fit for every workload. So for example, you might have certain workloads that run on some uh, set schedule and then there might be other workloads that uh, run in response to uh, events that might not happen very frequently. So in these cases, having your application on a virtual machine or a container or a bare metal system that's always up and running and consuming resources uh, can end up being very wasteful and expensive. So rather than having these applications always uh, actively polling and sending requests to see whether certain methods should be triggered and executed, an event-driven architecture can allow for resources to be con consumed more efficiently, but essentially they'll be consumed only as needed. So, oh, also a side note, so in this diagram, CF stands for uh, Cloud Foundry, so that's one of the more popular open source uh, uh, platform as a services. So this is actually the base product behind um, our, our cloud offering, uh, Bluemix. All right, so since this event-driven model allows for resources to be consumed more efficiently um, by consuming them all at, only as needed, this essentially enables developers to take advantage of a much better or more accurate billing model. And essentially the idea here is that this particular cost model uh, is built to only charge the consumer for the exact amount of time and resources uh, their code is using, so like down to the millisecond. So they, they're really getting what they pay for. So we're not necessarily saying that the server, serverless model is a perfect use case or um, uh, well, the perfect solution in all use cases. Uh, for example, like if your application is something like a UI, then a platform as a service might be better because you want the UI always up and um, accepting requests. But uh, this may be a better fit for some of the newer workloads. So if we look back at these emerging trends, uh, these newer type of workloads, uh, efficient resource consumption, and a uh, more accurate billing model, then we can see why these serverless and event-driven architectures are becoming so popular. And so since, these are, since there's such a demand, an increasing demand for these particular architectures, uh, new solutions are coming up very frequently. So that's something that us at IBM are very interested in being involved as well. So a few months ago, uh, IBM, I, I, actually that was in February, IBM uh, finally pushed a prototype of OpenWhisk to GitHub. So essentially OpenWhisk is a platform that allows for users to take advantage of event-driven architectures. So the idea is that the user can write um, some, snippet of co some snippets of code and be able to just upload that to the OpenWhisk code base. So these pieces of code can be configured in such a way that uh, they'll only be executed or invoked in response to certain events. Uh, so for those of you that have been experimenting with uh, Amazon Lambda or um, Azure Functions, um, this is essentially, you should already be familiar with this concept. It's essentially the same model, uh, but the primary difference here is that um, our solution is completely open source and can be run locally. 
And also, we're always looking for uh, new features and feedback uh, to come from the community. So we can talk a bit more in detail about the programming model. So there are four main entities in OpenWest. There are triggers, actions, roles, and packages. So a trigger essentially defines exactly which events OpenWest should pay attention to. So it can be essentially anything. It can be a database change, uh, incoming tweet, uh, data coming in from uh, various IoT devices, uh, messages coming in from a certain message bus, and so on. And also, um, custom triggers can be created as needed. So the developer will ultimately want to focus on implementing the logic to respond to these triggers by creating actions. Uh, so. These actions, uh, these actions just respond to uh, triggers or events. So they're essentially functions or snippets of code that can be uploaded to the OpenWest action pool like so. So this is an example of what a very simple hello world, um, hello world action will look like. So essentially it's just some, some code that will be placed in a file or in the OpenWest UI and then it will be uploaded to the OpenWest action pool. So as you see, there's quite a few uh, languages that we support so far, and we are in the process of adding more um, as needed. So uh, Swift is actually a newer open source language that was um, released by Apple, I'd say, about a year and some months ago. Um, and the, it, Swift is actually becoming very popular, uh, and it's very easy to pick up, and it can be uh, used as a front end or a back end language, or both. If there are any particular languages that we don't support yet, then essentially you can write your code in uh, Docker. So essentially you'll need to create a Docker image and you can upload that Docker image to the OpenWest database. And um, essentially as long as that particular image uh, follows a certain set of API rules and guidelines, then it should be able to be called like any other action. Uh, actions can also be chained together and executed in a particular sequence, so you can actually reuse pieces of code and combine them according to the needs of your application. So this allows for developers to be able to create applications in a loosely coupled fashion. Uh, so this fits the popular microservices design in which uh, we have a lot of small pieces of code that are running independent actions. Uh, next, so we have roles. So roles essentially tie everything together. They essentially define the relationship between a trigger and an action. So given the right set of rules, you can either have a single trigger kicking off multiple actions in parallel, um, or you can have the same action being uh, triggered by multiple events. Uh, so it's very flexible. Okay, and finally, actions and triggers can be bundled up into packages that can actually be shared and distributed using the OpenWest catalog. So you can either just use these bundles internally or you can choose to pu publish it to the public catalog um, to share with other WIS users. Okay, so now that we have these basic concepts down, let's see how everything uh, is tied together. So essentially the execution model will start with some event being uh, picked up by the system, so that would be a trigger. So the event trigger should have some set of rules associated with it, and, and those rules will dictate exactly uh, which action should be kicked off based on that trigger. So based off of the relevant rules, um, some pieces of code should be pulled out of the internal WIS uh, action pool and called from there in response to that request. Um, so the actions are called and uh, executed in temporary ephemeral containers. So the idea is that the code just uh, runs, um, runs, returns a response, and then uh, the container gets deleted. So it's supposed to be like uh, very, very quick and temporary. So how does OpenWIS work? 
So each function that is submitted to uh, the system gets associated with a particular rest endpoint. So you can actually invoke a function directly by uh, just by making a HTTP request. Such a request can be emitted by essentially any device that has internet connectivity. So this can be your laptop, your phone, um, a various sensor on your IoT network, and so on. So if you would rather not, so as an alternative to HTTP REST uh, requests, we can use something called, we call feeds. So feeds essentially monitor some service such as a database or a message bus like MQTT. So in these cases, uh, so every time a topic comes in, every time a message comes into a certain topic uh, on your MT, MQTT broker or a new record gets added or removed to a database, then an action can be triggered um, to respond to these changes. Okay, so just going over the high level implementation architecture. Uh, so this is a simplified version to show exactly how OpenWhisk works internally. So when a user sends out a request of, that might be from the UI, a CLI, or from an automated feed, uh, they'll be targeting an edge machine, which essentially um, acts as a proxy. So this is the primary endpoint for all WISP requests. So it acts as a proxy, and if the user calls an action, then um, the, this request is forwarded to the, to the controller, and the controller is essentially um, responsible for managing these API calls. So when, these, so when the request for action comes in, then the controller essentially ensures that the request is valid, so it checks the credentials and makes sure that the, um, that the action actually exists. And so once this uh, incoming request is validated, then, then the controller sends a message over the Kafka message bus. And essentially, um, it then basically calls the invoker machine um, and looks for which invoker machine is available and um, essentially, so the invoker machine is where the action will actually be executed. So the code that is associated with the action is pulled from the uh, database. So in this case, it will be a CouchDB database, which is uh, open source. So it's pulled out from the database and pulled into a Docker container and then just executed within that container. And once the process is completed, then a response is sent back to the user. And the container is then deleted. Uh, so there are uh, several, there, there's quite a bit of optimization to ensure that, to apply to the invoker to ensure that the activation time, or essentially the time between event being triggered and the uh, start of the execution is as low as possible. Okay. So just in summary, so I just want to stop here and trace back on and reiterate the main benefits on a serverless um, or event-driven framework such as OpenWIS. So essentially, OpenWIS allows for writing applications in a completely modular fashion. So this flexible model is great for IoT because it doesn't require any registration um, from devices as long as they have uh, internet connectivity, um, they can trigger and or respond to events. Uh, so generally, we found that the most efficient or the easiest way uh, to integrate IoT devices uh, into our um, OpenWIS applications are to use a uh, message bus like MQTT or Rabbit. So each component of the application can be written in a different language, uh, so just depending on what language is best for the task at hand. And furthermore, these components can easily be uh, shared or pulled down from either public or, or private uh, open list catalogs. Um, so some, so these, these can um, actually, so these components can easily be shared. I'm sorry, so the, these can actually be just used like off the shelf. So either, um, so they might be offered either in the open list catalog or the open source community. So um, also, uh, these computational tasks are outsourced to the cloud, so they're, they're, it's, it's great for mobile applications, so it makes it much more energy efficient and um, it won't drain your battery as much when you're using it. And um, also, finally, the developer doesn't have to worry about 
uh, scaling or configuring servers, uh, they only have to pay for the uh, resources that they're actually using. So it's, it's very granular and you can essentially like rip and replace modules without breaking a call stack. Okay, so that, that actually uh, concludes my presentation. So does anybody have any questions? So essentially, if, if you just want to play around with some Hello World actions, then the, the easiest way to get this set up is you can just like run it on your own laptop. So essentially, you'll use Vagrant, and Vagrant will spin up a virtual machine, go through install Docker and all the prerequisites, and then, and, and then set up the OpenWhisk components. So each component actually runs in a, um, in a Docker container. So it's, it's pretty easy. But so if, if, you, if it turns out that you like OpenWhisk and you want to scale up, then essentially what you'll need, you'll need uh, IaaS, so that'll be something like uh, OpenStack, uh, VMware, or AWS. And essentially what they'll go do, they'll uh, spin up a series of virtual machines and um, also install Docker and then just communicate uh, with Docker over the, the um, base port, the TCP port, and then it'll go through and configure them. So um, th these are actually like Ansible scripts that are um, still in, in the works, but essentially these, these scripts can, you can run them either from your laptop, as long as you have internet connectivity to uh, each of the virtual machine IPs, um, or, you can, or you can like stand up a bootstrapper VM within that IS and um, run it from there. No problem. Uh, do I have any other questions? Okay, so essentially the device would, um, if, if you're making an HTTP uh, request, then essentially the device would, um, so it will specify the action name either in the URL or it can also uh, pass data using a, a JSON object as well. So uh, the, does that pretty much answer your question or? Yes, yes, you can. Yeah. How's IBM Watson RT platform and OpenWhisk uh, integrated? Because we have streams of data for individual devices and Watson RT platform. And I want actions associated with them different. And OpenWhisk be used to work with? Yeah, so actually, so the way that that will work, so by, by default, we have a few. Um, built-in actions and essentially what these would do. So if you're using OpenWhisk, then um, you essentially also have a Bluemix account associated with it. And this Bluemix account has a full catalog of different Watson, um, Watson services. So this might be a speech to text, this might be like language analytics um, and so on. So basically, ba basically you do that when you're setting up the action. I, I should be... So like this, this is essentially like what our UI looks like. So you would create an action, you would just like write some code, and then basically from there, then you can specify exactly like how that action would be triggered. So, um, th so this is where you would actually, uh, oh yeah, okay, so here's the catalog. So essentially like these are all the various, um, various triggers that you can set up with your action. And no, so this is actually, so the U, you'll get everything except for the UI. Okay. Yeah. Now, what I'm not sure is, where does the pay as you go come in? If I spin up my own OpenWhisk server, then um, what goes to IBM for pay as you go? Is it not? Oh, if, if you spin up your own, then you, yeah, like IBM doesn't get anything. So essentially, the way that, um, so if you're running it yourself, then we would essentially get paid through the Watson or the, the various catalog calls. Okay. 
But yeah, so yeah, if, if you're running it on your own hardware, you don't pay for that. Uh, yes, actually, I believe. So there's James Thomas in the UK. He, he actually talks a bit about um, how to create your own open with, uh, so this is a feed, but he also has a variety of uh, packages and, um, yeah, and various uh, components as well from, so from his own catalog. I think, I'm not sure if he has a link here. Oh yeah, and this this is essentially like how you would if so if you stand up your own instance, that's essentially how you would um you would have to interact with the OpenWest deployment uh, using a CLI. I'm trying to see if I have a link to his. Uh... Oh yeah, okay. So that's how you would create a package. Um, any other questions? So not yet. Actually, so that's going to be the next issue. We're, we're still, I'm still talking with the OpenWIS team to uh, figure out um, how to go forward with that. So at the moment, um, if you're deploying your own OpenWIS, um, if you're setting up your own OpenWIS deployment, then essentially you'd specify in the Ansible scripts exactly how many invoker uh, VMs you want. So it, it doesn't, it, it wouldn't go out and like, just like scale and create uh, additional virtual machines, but we're, we're in the process of uh, setting up Elk and Kibana and so on, and basically um, based on the output there, then you can essentially like monitor the amount of resources that are being used across your invoker virtual machines. And, um, but, so it's, it's a half-baked, like we're still like thinking it out. But the, uh, the, our, hope, our hosted service on Bloomix.net, it, it does that for you. So I'm not entirely too sure. Because um, from what I know, the user credentials, well, I, I believe like the authorization information that lives in, oh, yeah, it's not even up. So the authorization um, information is actually, it lives in CouchDB. So like that, that's what you would communicate with if you wanted to create new users or change your password, namespace, and so on. No problem. Um, do I have any other questions? <laughs> What's the role of the console? So from my understanding, I, so console is a key value service. And from my understanding, it keeps track of um, so it keeps a log of the invoker of the incoming requests, and then it, it also uh, keeps the status of the invoker machines. Oh, I see. Um, wait, so, so let me make sure that I have your question correct. So you're saying, like, essentially, if you, like, create your own... Um, For example, actual, so I try translator. Mm -hmm. And I allow the user's translator by other people. Somehow. I see, I see. So that, that is still... Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm not too sure. I would have to talk to my manager about that. Because there, there are like a couple, like CouchDB, for example, is uh, one of the newer um, services that we've like actually added as a, it's actually a service in Bluemix as well. So like there, there would just have to be some, yeah, we we'll just have to like work it out there. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure, yeah, that doesn't really answer the question, but um, I'm not too sure.
Um, oh. do, you, do, do you ever consider to, to deploy this model on the embedded device, not in the cloud? So we have thought about that. So I did, in theory, that may work, at least. So if your embedded device is able to run Docker, it was something like the Raspberry Pi, then ideally it should work because each of these, um, each of these components are actually running in a Docker containers. So the tricky part would probably be like the invoker. Um, so like just figuring out, yeah, so, so it, it would essentially be the same, um, same model as the single deployment model where you spin up a vagrant VM and, um, and deploy all the components there. So ideally, it should be. I haven't. I haven't tested it personally, though. But it, ideally, it should be able to work. How many actions can you can can an invoker handle at once? Is it is it a, is it a single single request uh, blocking sort of request, or can it handle multiple asynchronous? Oh, okay. So it's it's entirely asynchronous. So I'm not sure. I'm actually in the middle of uh, testing to see exactly how many. Um, how many actions you can run in parallel, but... Um, but you can run actions in parallel. You can, yes. With, so it, with, with a single invoker? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Also, is, is, is it stable or is it broken? Oh, yes, it's stable. Yeah. Yes. So with the HTTP requests coming in, the body of the request, is that JSON? Yes, that would be JSON. Okay. So you, you don't necessarily have to uh, pass a body, but like if, if there are various, if there are like actual parameters that you want to, let me see if I have it still up. So essentially it would be called as an argument here and um, you can just like call, well you, you can like pull things out of the JSON object. So it would be that, it would be that params object there. And also, if you guys like wanted to play around with OpenWhisk, um, or the hosted version, then you can just go to boomix.net, and essentially you can set up uh, you can set up your own account, and it will be free. Um, yeah, it will be free like up to a certain usage, I believe. So, like for example, with the Watson services, I think um, after the first thousand or so, I think it's a thousand or two thousand requests, then you start getting charged. But yeah. So there are, there are like free tri trials out there initially. But like when you have like an application that's actually, you know, like running all the time and chewing up resources, then that's when uh, payment arises. Okay, okay so if there's no further questions, then that concludes my presentation.